Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Math 301, Introduction to Combinatorial Theory. Today, we're going to start graph theory, which is really a cool topic. So graphs show up all over the place from you know, mostly in networks. So examples could include social networks like social media. It also could include biological networks like uh, networks of, of animal communication or blood vessels in your body. Uh, it can include neuro, neural networks of, of connections in your brain and transportation networks. Also, uh, a major topic in graph theory is optimization problems. So what's the fastest way to get information from one hub to many other hubs? Or what is the cheapest way to deliver materials across this, this system? So we're going to be talking about um, a lot of practical things about graphs, but also some fun aspects about graphs. And since today is Halloween, at least for me, I wanted to um, start with some of the fun applications. So uh, first of all, let's think about uh, how many graphs there are. And so I guess I should really define a graph, although we did that in a bit in chapter one. A graph is a collection of vertices and edges. The edges show a connection between various vertices. And so, for example, here is a graph on, on five vertices. So there are lots of things we can say about this graph. For example, it's connected because you can walk from any vertex to any other moving along the edges. We say that these two vertices are adjacent because there's an edge between them. But we don't say that this vertex and this vertex are adjacent because you have to pass through three edges to get from one to the other. So that's an example of a graph of five vertices. This one has an interesting uh, feature of having a cycle. So you can move around in a, a circle and that's a cycle of length three. Here's some other uh, graphs that have five vertices and a cycle of length three. You could have a triangle with uh, something sticking off like that, or you could have a, a triangle with a triangle with two things sticking off one of the uh, vertices of the triangle. There's something, this is actually called the chair graph. It looks a little bit, looks a little bit like a chair or you could have a, um, this is a called a fan. So in a graph like that, or you could have a graph with many triangles. So you could have a graph like that. All the ones I've, I've drawn so far are planar graphs in that none of the edges cross over each other when I draw them. Uh, let's see, maybe we'll just do one or two more. This one is called the path graph P5. Looks like a path graph. And finally, we could draw the cycle graph, which is uh, five vertices with five edges making a circle. There's something called the bow tie graph, which looks like two triangles. So these are all examples of graphs with five vertices. And actually I'm nowhere near done yet. It turns out there are 34 graphs on five vertices. And of those, 20 of, 21 of them are connected, meaning that they just have one piece. And so far I've only drawn one, two, three, four, five, six, nine of them. So these are all examples of, of graphs and the, the number of graphs increases dramatically as you as you increase the number of vertices. So let's just okay, so those are all examples of of graphs. And now um, now let's look at one particular of these a little more a little more closely. Let's look at this hat graph. And I don't think this is actually called the hat graph, but yeah. 
All right, so here's this particular graph. And there are a couple of things we might wanna think about with this graph. First of all, how do we really tell whether something is the same as this graph or not? It turns out there, there are many different ways of, of drawing this graph. We could draw it more like a house. We could draw it more like some sort of funny looking, funny looking um, thing. There are lots of different ways of drawing this same graph. So we need to think, how are we gonna tell if two graphs are the same or not? We're gonna say that two graphs are isomorphic or the same if there's a way that they can be identified with each other. And what does that mean? It means that we need to label vertices. So for instance, I could label these vertices one, two, three, four, and five. Lots of different ways. In fact, there are five factorial ways of labeling this graph on five vertices. So I need to find a way of labeling the vertices of this graph so that uh, everything matches up in exactly the right way. So maybe I'll start by looking at this vertex. In this case, you can see that this vertex one only connects with one other vertex. And so this is a good choice for number one. And then I could make this one number four and this two, three and five. Over here, I could make this one number one on the right, but then I'm forced to make this number two and, and, then, and then actually I'm forced to make this one number four and then this one number three and then this one number five. So there, we're gonna say that two graphs are isomorphic or the same if there's a way to um, pair the vertices of graph one with the vertices of graph two, uh, such that two vertices are adjacent in graph one, if and only if they are adjacent or their pairs, their matches are adjacent in graph two. Okay. So in order to decide whether two graphs are isomorphic, we need to label them. And in fact, there turns out to be a very open problem in mathematics to decide if somebody hands you two different graphs how to decide whether or not they are isomorphic. So that raises the question, how is someone gonna hand you a graph? Like it's all very nice to draw these pictures, but at some point, if we want to put these graphs into a computer, we need to find a way of um, storing the information of a graph. And this is covered in section 8.7. And there are two basic methods that we'll start with. Um, the first is called the adjacency matrix. And the idea of the adjacency matrix is you make a matrix. So in this case, it's gonna be a five by five array. And again, we're gonna to have to label the vertices of our graph. So today we'll again, look at this hat, hat graph and I'm gonna label the vertices like this. And you put a zero if um, vertex I and vertex J are not adjacent. And you put a one if vertex i and vertex j are adjacent.
one thing I should have said about graphs is that we are never going to allow a vertex to be adjacent to itself. So we're not gonna draw any loops that start at one vertex and come back to that vertex. And what that means is that we can always put zeros right down the diagonal. And then for this particular hat graph, vertex two is connected to vertex um, one and five. I'm doing this wrong. Uh, vertex one is just connected to vertex two. Vertex two is connected to vertex one and vertex five. Well, I'm just completely botching this. Two is connected to what? One, three, and five. All right. One, vertex two is connected one, three, and five. Okay. And vertex three is connected to two, four, and five. All right, and then vertex five is connected to two and three, but not four. Okay, so this is the adjacency matrix. So let's think about some pros and cons of this. Well, one thing to notice is that it initially looks pretty big. We have five squared entries, or more generally, we'd have n squared entries, which is the uh, where if n is the number of vertices. But some of them are zero, so we can ignore those. And then notice that this matrix is symmetric because vertex one is connected to vertex two exactly when vertex two is connected to vertex one. So really, we don't really need all five entries. We just need the ones in either the lower half or the upper half of the matrix. And so how many is that? It's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We really need, we really need, we need to keep track not just of 25 entries, but of 10, 10 entries are the ones that really count. And more generally, what we would do is subtract n for getting rid of the diagonal ones and then divide by two. Um, and these entries are zero or one in general. Now, if you take an advanced course on graph theory, you might want to label edges by their cost, or you might want to have edges labeled with a direction, for instance, for water flow. And in order, and then, or you might want to allow an edge to be adjacent to itself with a self loop. And this, this storage method can handle all of those things by instead of just having zeros and ones, you replace it with um, positive and negative numbers in this adjacency matrix. So, so those are some things about this storage structure. Another thing, another kind of nice thing, so th this is actually kind of a lot of n, this is a lot especially as n gets big. So that's a little bit of a drawback. But one thing that's nice about this structure is that it's uh, easy to edit. So for example, let's say I wanted to get rid of this edge between two and three. So I wanted to erase that edge. Whoops, I didn't mean to erase the edge between three and five. So if I wanted to erase that edge between two and three, that would be no problem. I would just go in and delete these two these two entries and replace them with the zero, and so that's that's easy to edit. So that's a that's one nice thing about this. Another nice thing about this, I'm going to put this edge between two and three back. So another nice thing about this graph is it tells you a lot about walks. We're going to talk about walks later in this chapter. But for example, let's say you were starting at vertex two, you want to go for a walk and you want to figure out where can you get in one step? Of course, the adjacency matrix tells you that if you're starting at vertex two, you can get to either vertex one, three, or five in one step. So you could either get to one, three, or five. 
And then you could wonder, how long will it take you to get back to vertex two? Well, you could go to vertex one and then back. So you could take two steps to get back to vertex two. Or you could go around from two to five to three back to two, or from two to three to five back to two. So there are lots of different ways you can take walks in this graph from vertex two around and back. And it turns out, uh, and this is something I'm, I'm hoping we're gonna have time for in this class, that powers of this matrix, and by that we mean matrix multiplication, which you might've seen in linear algebra, but if you haven't, don't worry about it. But the powers of the matrix tell you the number of walks that start and end at a certain vertex. So that's a really powerful aspect of this adjacency matrix. It also turns out, in fact, this adjacency matrix, you could spend a whole three months just learning about the adjacency matrix and um, some linear algebra facts such as the, the eigenvalues of certain matrices tell you a lot about the graph. All right, so there's another storage structure though, which is, uh, I don't know what this is called, maybe an edge array. And the idea with the edge array is that you just keep track of the edges. So here's our hat graph, one, two, three, four, five. And we're gonna just keep track. One is connected to two, two is connected to three. Three is connected to four. Mm. Well, we also know that two is connected to five and also that three is connected to five. So this information is another way of storing the structure of this graph. Again, we had to label the graph. So one, one advantage of this method is that it really takes up less space, especially if your graph has very few edges. So if, if E is the number of edges, then we really just need to keep track of two E entries. And now the entries are numbers between uh, one and N. I think in the textbook, it says between zero and N minus one. I maybe should have started labeling my graphs with going from zero to four instead of from one to five. Okay, so that's another, um, another storage structure. This one is a little bit harder to edit. And so that's a bit of a drawback. So one last thing that we could do in this, in this course is to talk a bit about coloring problems. Turns out coloring problems have a lot of applications in, in chemistry. So we could think about, um, can you color the vertices of this graph with two colors? Well, sure, but then there's a, a condition such that no adjacent vertices no pair of, uh, I guess, no, no two vertices that are adjacent have the same color. Okay, so let's start with the inspiring color of black. If I make this one black, then the next one can't be black because it's adjacent but I could make it orange. Well, if that one's orange, then this one has to be black. And, ah, oh, but then this one cannot be black or orange because it's adjacent to an orange one and adjacent to a black one. Maybe I have to color this one red. And then and then I have choices for the next one. This one could be black or orange. Okay, so the answer, answer here is no. And we'll see that the real 
question going on here is whether or not this graph is bipartite, meaning whether you can put all the vertices onto either the left side or the right side so that no two left-hand vertices are connected and no two right-hand vertices are connected. And here we can't do that. Like if we started like putting this one on the left, we tried to put this one on the left, then this one would have to be on the right. And then this one would have to be on the left, but then this one's connected to both the left one and the right one. So this is, we're gonna, we're gonna learn more about this later, but we're gonna say that this is not a bipartite graph. A harder question then, okay, well, we said we could do this with three colors, is how many ways uh, can you color this graph with three colors? And that's, that's actually a little bit of a tricky counting problem because well, maybe not so bad. Let's figure out, so we'd have, let's label these vertices one, two, three, four, five. So then we would have uh, vertex one, we would have three choices for the color. Vertex two, well, it can't be the same color as vertex one. So we'd only have two choices. So we want it to be not the same as vertex one. Then we'd get to uh, vertex five. We'd again have two choices because it couldn't be the same as two. Then we get to vertex three. Now vertex three can't be the same as two or it can't be the same as five. So there's only one choice for that. And then vertex four, we would again have two choices. This one is not the same as vertex three, uh, vertex two or five. Okay, so altogether we would have three, six, uh, 12, 24, we're gonna multiply these numbers. So we'd have 24 ways to color this graph with three colors. All right, so I think that's the end of today's lecture. And next time we'll talk more about degrees of vertices and graphs that show up so often that they have a name. See you later.